So grazie, Sandro. Um, I'm going to use the microphone, at least for, for now. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, bonsoir, bonsoir. Uh, thank you for being here for this festive celebration of being queer, Italian, in Montreal. Um, you know, tonight we're going to be hearing from uh, some of the queer cultural makers in the city, past, present, and future, uh, about their projects and where their identities as queer and Italian Canadian people uh, intersect. Uh, this will take form of a screening of a short documentary uh, directed by author and filmmaker Licia Canton. Thank you, Licia. Um, and followed by a panel discussion with Montrealers Gaspar Borsellino, V. Di Lucorio, and Steve Galluccio. And then the event will end with a Q&A session. Uh, before we begin, though, uh, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, as queer Canadians of Italian origin, we are settlers on this land. And I'd like to acknowledge the communities who were here before us, uh, namely the Ganigahaga, uh, the city of Montreal's unceded territory and known as Jajage in their language. And we honor and thank the traditional custodians of this land and strive to work for the success of future generations. Uh, there are also some other people I would like to thank. First, I would like to thank Sandro. Thank you, Sandro, so much. Um, thank you to Laura and the team here at the Institute for being such wonderful hosts. Really, uh, I'm honored and humbled uh, to be able to present this event here uh, in this building, and I could not have done it without you. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the Prosecco. It's made me really relaxed uh, to be up here. Uh, I'd also like to thank Leecha Canton, who in many ways is the reason for all of this. Uh, Leecha has demonstrated what true allyship is through the filming of this documentary that we're about to see, uh, as well as the publication of Here and Now, an anthology of queer Italian-Canadian writing, which is for sale at the back from Longridge Books. Uh, Leecha, I've said this before. Where are you, Leecha? Are you here? Okay, Leecha. Um, uh, you know, participating in this project for you has been such uh, a wonderful thing for me. It's opened so many doors creatively, so uh, I can't thank you enough. And uh, I also want to thank Dominic, Achenti Magazine, and Longbridge Books. Um, and also thank you to the cinematographers who made the film, uh, Justine Rivard and Beatrice Langosi Vitez. Justine, are you in the room? Oh, hi, Justine. Nice to see you again. Thank you for being here. Um, a big thank you also to Fierté Montréal. This project is supported by Fierté Montréal and is one of the official events of this year's celebrations. And we are thrilled that they have chosen to sponsor this event. Montreal's Pride celebration happen all month, but most events will take place August 1st through 7th. Uh, so like I said, first we're, gonna, we're going to watch the documentary, but before we do, I'd like to ask uh, Licha to come say a few words. Uh, in addition to directing the film, uh, Licha is the author of two books, The Pink House and Other Stories, and Almond Wine and Fertility. She has edited several anthologies, including Here and Now, which I mentioned at the back, and is currently looking for new submissions for Volume 2. So if you are a queer Italian Canadian and a writer, or want to write, want to write about your experience, she's accepting submissions for the second volume of the book. Uh, Licha is also the founding editor-in-chief of Accenti and current president of the Association of Italian Canadian Writers. She also is co-director of the Queer Italian Canadian Artist Project at U of T. So Licia, you want to come say a few words. Thank you. Buonasera, bonsoir. Je suis très heureuse d'être ici ce soir. Finally, an in-person screening of this film is the first. Uh, we've done a number of virtual screenings, but it's nice to see people in the room, and so thank you all for being here. Uh, first, thanks Chris Dirato for organizing this event. My turn as well to thank Instituto, Direttore Capelli, all the staff, Laura, etc. Uh, it's always wonderful to be at the Instituto. And I'm so excited to share this film with you, and I'm particularly happy that the three authors that I interviewed are here tonight. Steve Galuccio, Chris Dirado, and also Liana Guzmanos, who's at the back. And as Chris mentioned, we are really thrilled that cinematographer Justin Rivard is here with us tonight. Unfortunately, Beatrice could not be here, and also Dominic Benaventi could not be here, but they send their best regards. The initial plan for the film was to interview 10 writers across Canada, 10 Italian-Canadian writers who also identify as members of the LGBTQ plus community. We only knew of 10 back in 2019 when we started talking about this project. And when I say we, I mean the Queer Studies in Quebec Research Group and the Association of Italian Canadian Writers, the funders of the film. The objective for doing a film instead of a book, 
those of you who know me, I work with books, not with film. This is my first film, was to reach a wider audience, uh, multiple generations. So we're thinking also the nono and the nonna, lo zio, la zia, uh, to get people talking, to get communities talking, diverse communities who often don't talk to each other with ease. Um, and as Dominic Benaventi says in the film, you will hear, um, there's still a culture of silence. Yes, there has been a lot of improvement over the past few decades, but there is, it's still difficult for some people who are of Italian origin. Um, and I'm looking for, uh, forward to the discussion with V and Steve and uh, Gaspari. There we go. You got it right, right? <laughs> okay. Um, the documentary, as I said, has led to a number of virtual events for which I'm really grateful for. It has led to a volume of 38 writers of Italian origin who are also queer. And to be included in the volume, you didn't have to write about your queer experience or your Italian experience. You only had to identify as a member of both communities. And that's the same thing for the, the second volume. So if you are of Italian origin, if you identify as a member of the LGBTQ community, if you'd like to write about anything, write to me, all right? My, write to me at accenti at accenti.ca. That's easiest. Um, yes, and it has also led, this film has led to a research project at the University of Toronto, as Chris mentioned. So the film has led to important projects and important discussions, but I think the challenge is still the one of taking these conversations and discussions beyond the artistic, creative, and academic circles so that the daily lives of queer Italian Canadians are easier, not to say in some cases, less painful. So I'm really grateful for this event tonight to every person and organization who has contributed to making it happen. And in particular, Fierte Memorial, Instituto Violet Hour, and Accenti Magazine. Thank you so much for listening. I know it may be a little struggle for some people at the back to, to see. Um, uh, sorry, there's no way I can kind of get us a little higher. Um, but but thank you. Um, do I use the microphone? Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, cool. Thank you. So we only have my one microphone. I will pass it, but if you decide to kind of project loudly, feel free to, to, to do that. So I'm going to introduce our panelists first. So um, to my left right here is Steve Galuccio. Steve is a playwright and screenwriter. His first major play, Mambo Italiano, was turned into a movie, which sold in more than 53 countries. He's also known for the Gemini award-winning TV series Ciao Bella and the movies Funky Town and Little Italy. His new play, At the Beginning of Time, will be premiering in February 2023 at the Centaur Theatre. Welcome, Steve. <laughs> Beside Steve is Gaspar. Is it Gaspari? Am I okay? Oh Have I been staying it wrong all this time? Yeah, it's okay. Gas Gaspare, Gaspare, but there are cousins of mine named Gaspare, and they say Gaspare. So, you know, <laughs> Gaspare. Gaspare Borsellino is uh, the former president of the Grupo Italiano Gay y Lesbico de Montreal, uh, a one-time social club for LGBTQ folks of Italian origin that played a significant role in queer cultural life in Montreal from the mid-1990s uh, to the mid-2000s. Please welcome Gaspare. I love the bow tie, too. Thanks. Um, and then uh, at the end here, we have V. De Gregorio. Uh, v is a non-binary multimedia artist and writer. Their work focuses on transnationalism, historical revisionism, and the personal, and the inconsistencies of memory. They hold a degree in photography, as well as a BFA in film production from Concordia University, and currently working in documentary filmmaking. They are a founding member of CHOW, Canadian Italians Against Oppression. Please welcome V. All right. So I have questions for each of our panelists, and then we're going to open up to a big discussion. And at the end, uh, there'll be time to ask questions of the panelists, and also Licha, if you're wanting to answer some questions about the film. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Steve. 
Uh, you were the reason I got the idea for this event. Um, I had learned that the Pointe Carrière Museum in Montreal had just wrapped their Italian Montreal exhibit, and there had been no real mention of the contributions of LGBTQ Montrealers in the exhibit. And this was something that um, you tried to bring this gap to their attention, uh, but were brushed off. So can you let us know a little bit about what happened? Sure. sure. So, hi, everybody. By the way, my movie was sold in 53 countries. I should be richer. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, <laughs> so yeah, so uh, going back to this museum thing. So there was this uh, exhibit called, uh, I think, Les Stades in Montréal. And uh, a friend of mine texted me. So there was uh, this section about Italian Montrealers who had accomplished stuff recently. And uh, so a friend of mine texted me and uh, said, you know, Steve, did you not want to be part of this exhibition? And I said, what exhibition? What are you talking about? And she said, well, you know, there's people that have accomplished stuff recently, and you're not in it. And you did do some stuff not so long ago. And I said, okay. So anyways, I went to the exhibit, and uh, I wasn't there, obviously. And I thought to myself, not only am I, am I not there, but Chris isn't there, Gaspar isn't there. A lot of my queer Italian friends who are designers who are well known are not there. And I thought, this is the problem because if we're going to depict Italian Montrealers, we are also part of the Italian Montreal community, although some of the community would like us not to be part of it. And uh, so I, that was a bit bitchy and mean, and you should have laughed at that. Whatever. <laughs> so. <laughs> It was disguised. So anyway, um, what happened is that I wrote an email to the organizer of the exhibit, and um, they very nicely uh, answered me and were a bit taken aback by my by my comment, by my uh, pointing this out to them, and they had said they had no idea because they didn't actually organize the event. They only, you know, they were, they were just the museum. So the organizers of the event, they are the ones that overlooked us. And it was their prominent members of the Italian community, i.e. old straight white men. Therefore, I said, well, the next time, just stay away from the prominent members of the Italian communities and ask us, right? So therefore, Chris, I told Chris about it. I think I even sent you the email I sent them. It was a nice, I was polite, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Which is so unusual for me. <laughs> so, and uh, so he told me that he came up with this thing. And here we are. Well, I'm, I'm glad that we're doing it. I think we're going to correct that wrong tonight, right? I think with this event, that's that's the point. Um, it, it's quite an omission for, for you not to be there. I think you probably are the most famous gay Italian uh, Canadian person I know. I, don't, I can't, I'd be hard pressed. I think you'd be a Jeopardy question. I really think you would. Uh, so for you not to be there, uh, it was a, a huge omission. And um, no, notably, the success of Mon Battaliano. I mean, you know, it was a huge success in English and in French, um, you know, which is also quite unique here in Montreal for something to be so popular in both languages when it came out in 2000 and 2001, respectively. Um, and I know that you've, you've contributed, you know, produced a significant body of work since then, and you did talk a bit about it in, in the film, but. I'd like to talk a bit about Mambo, but just because it launched your career and it also started a conversation. Um, uh, can you take us back to that time? I know that you'd already been doing kind of like uh, queer theater at the Fringe, but you know, with this play uh, that was at Dusep, was that Dusep and the Centaur? Did you have an idea of like what was going to come? Uh, no, I had no idea. I mean, it was a big surprise that it was such a huge uh, success. Um, I mean, the way it came about really is that I, I had been writing all my, I mean, I've been writing for 10 years and been doing Fringe Festival and I've been doing what we used to call back then guerrilla theater, which was we're a theater group and we would go around the streets of the plateau and pretend we were terrorists and stuff like that and film it and ha ha ha. We couldn't do that now because we'd be arrested, but it was, that's what we did back then. So I did a bunch of plays and then I got really tired of being in the paper all the time and being flat broke. And I said, okay, I, if I wanted, I mean, it's 40, so I said, if I want to do this as a career, I, I better get serious about it. So I wrote Mambo, not thinking much about it. And I, at the time, I had somehow, I met the, uh, Emile Baudreau, who introduced me to the French side of, of 
the of showbiz, if you will. And I started writing in French. And I said to Emil, I, I showed him the play, I said, do you think Michel Trompe would translate this? And he said, sure. So we sent it to Michel through him, uh, Emil's agent. Michel translated it. They sent it to various theaters. And for some reason, Set picked it up, which was one of the straightest theaters in Montreal at the time, as was Centaur. So Set is this huge theater, it's 800 seats. So next thing I know, it's like December 2000, and this little kid from the fringe is a fucking set in front of 800 people, and it's the premiere, and the thing just took off. Like everybody was there, everybody in the Quebec showbiz realm was there, and I had grown up with all of them, and I was just, Michel Tremblay was next to me. I'm like, what is this? Where am I? Who, what, what is going on here? You know, where's, where's the fringe tent? You know, where's the. <laughs> so, um, and I just, it took off, and what was exceptional about it was that the Italian community embraced this play. And so both at SEP, and then we went, it, it was played at Centaur, because we had a hard time getting into Centaur too, because you have to realize this was 2000, 2001, and gay theater in mainstream theater, no bueno, I mean, you know, you didn't, you just didn't, that's something that didn't happen, right? And this play took off, and the Italian community embraced it. And you had people of every generation coming to see this play. It was spectacular. You had little nonnas coming into the play going, oh my god, no, que bellas en bonchina, I would make it bad. Oh, okay, the two men are kissing, let's not look at that. You know, like, <laughs> but I was stunned. I was stunned. It was beautiful. It was just Absolutely beautiful. And it wasn't by design or anything. I thought I was going to be doing it at the fringe, you know? So all of a sudden, and then it was turned into a movie, and then whatever. And it just took off. You told me this, like, story that you were, like, at a wedding, and, like, you were in a... Can you tell that story? This is so embarrassing, because I went to this wedding, and um, so, you know, back in the day when they... I mean, do they still do set Italian weddings? They stand in line, and you go congratulating everybody. They still do that? Yeah, okay. So I, I went in and I'm congratulating, and the bride, I think I knew the groom. I don't remember whose wedding, I've been to so many weddings, I was ushered eight times from 1970 to 1977, so. You and me both. Isn't that awful? Those, uh, yeah, those things yeah. and the tails and the things. I was an usher, in my case, I was an usher, not oh, yours, but. Oh, oh, yeah, I was an usher too, yeah. I know, but you were a bride. A groom as well. I was a groom twice, yeah. 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 Once in my house and once at the notary's office. But it was, <laughs> Oh, yeah, the rock, yeah, the wedding. So the bride, the bride went to her dad and she said, I saw her doing like this. So I passed the, you know, I congratulate everybody. The, the dad and the hus and his wife, they left the line and they came up to me and they said, Mr. Galucha, Mr. Galucha, I turned around. I'm like, yes, yes, what is it? She said, oh my God, we're so, we love you and we love your stuff and oh, this is so wonderful now. I said, oh, well, thank you. That's really, thank you. It's great to be here. Congratulations again. And, and they went back. And I thought that was so bizarre. They left the line. Everybody was like, you know, what the fuck are they doing? What's going on? And so that was cool. Yeah, it's great because like theater audiences tend to be more like, I, I you know, uh, I want to say cultured, but like, you know, they're like more progressive, I guess is the word I'm like saying. So, no, it, no, no. not at all. <laughs> not at all. Every, not the progressive ones. Are you kidding me? The progressive when Mambo came out, the progressive ones, the gay groups and all that, I mean, the hardcore gay groups, they were they were so mad at me because they're like, what do you mean people are still in the closet? And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? You're obviously not Italian or Greek or Portuguese or ethnic in any capacity because everyone was in the closet back then in 2000. I mean, you know, you were, you, I heard that you were, you know, president of the Italians and you were in the closet, yeah. right? I was in the closet too. I, mean, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> well, I like, no, I'm sorry. Is that the only thing you were going to say? No. Jesus Christ. But yes, okay. <laughs> I was the president of that group and I was dodging the cameras. There you yeah. go. I was dodging the cameras. Cameras. gay pride. I was. Okay. But so the gays that were like super political, I mean, especially in Toronto, they were like against this play and they said that it, I brought the Italian culture back, I don't know how many years. In San Francisco, when they played in San Francisco, I remember reviewers saying that I should be fitted for cement booties and thrown in the river uh, because of what I did to it. So it wasn't like the progressives didn't like the play. Oh my God, no, because it like it kind of showed them that being gay was still not cool 
and now, we know now, thanks to Trump and every and the Republican Party and everything that you know they want to kill us all. So back then, everybody was living in a false paradise, except for me. So. Mm-hmm. Well, that is a good segue to talk to to, to move to Gaspar. So um, uh, I do have questions for you. <laughs> so the Grupo Italiano Gay Lesbico. Um, uh, no, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Um, uh, had the adorable acronym Giggle, which I always thought was so funny. It was like it Grupo was, Italiano no. Gay. It was it. It was not intentional. Okay. Um, and. And I've been to the parties. They were very active for about 10 years, uh, from 1996 to the 2000s. And as president, you led the group during a, a really memorable time, I feel like, in, for me anyway, in terms of Montreal's past. Can you speak a bit to that time and what prompted the creation of the group? Yeah, um, yeah so the group, I think we said, went from 1996 to about 2005. I kind of led the group. Um, it, a bit from the beginning until 2000, 2001, so I can speak about that. And then afterwards I was involved, but not so much. First of all, <clears throat> and I think I'm a little bit too loud, um, someone, someone else started the group, uh, basically put an ad back then, it was in the hour or in mirror, maybe I just shouldn't use it at all, because I speak so lower, loud. Lower, lower. <laughs> over like this yeah um yeah so someone else started the group and then after eight months the person moved away moved to bc and uh, someone had to take over um and i did um we mostly had many social events um you know picnics um potlucks yes you know lots of good italian food and um what else did we do um, I, I was looking, because of this, I was looking through things. We, then we had interesting events. Uh, after a few years, we did something called La Scala, or Lounge. It was a lounge, I think, around where Saloon is or something. Yeah, so we brought in some opera singers. That was a big event. I noticed, and my memory is failing me a little bit, but we, you know, we had an event where we kind of did a, a gay prom because... A lot of us were not open and out, and we, we weren't ourselves when we went to our prom. So we brought our graduation pictures. We, we did some other event where it was like a, a wedding shower, you know, um, stuff like that. We also did have in the first years, for about two years, I would say, if not more, there was a discussion group. Um, and then... And because I was leading the group, I went to I went to every event, and I definitely went to every discussion group. That got a little bit heavier, you know. People spoke about uh, their, you know, their their being queer, being different. Uh, in many cases, families that um, you know their parents didn't know or family members didn't know. I'll never forget a woman who basically, and I, you know, I could understand that, I'm, I'm going to be 60, I have a sister, and so this woman in the group basically said, being a, a, an Italian lesbian um, is like being doubly cursed, you know, especially, well, especially back then, there was a double standard between the boys and the girls in a family, uh, and then, the, you know, being, being a lesbian was just you were supposed to get married. And uh, uh, and that was that was it's still something when I think about hearing that from somebody in the group, um, and uh, yeah, that's a little bit about the, about the group. Sorry, I didn't mean to get so emotional. Um, yeah, anything? Just, yeah. Just ask the next question. Um, you know, you you mentioned to me I think when we talked about this before that many Italians actually thought they were the only one before the group, right? Like there was you know they didn't really know anyone, and. Um, uh, and the group, in a weird way, kind of was a sh- was able. To, it was almost like a sh- be able to have a shorthand with other people about like certain things that you didn't have to kind of explain to anyone. So I think like the Steve yeah. was kind of alluding to that as well. Can you speak to a bit about that? Like, um, you know, what what people were looking for when they were joining the group. Yeah. So so in in '96 when the first people came to the group, um, we were like 12 or 14 guys. You know, ranging from 20-something to 40 or something in, in age. And yeah, and the first few meetings, we were just guys. 
uh, men. And uh, yeah, I remember somebody at one of those first meetings saying, oh my God, I thought I was the only one, you know? Um, and so it was, it was really something to just, you know, be with other people who were also, who were also gay. Um, and I think as I told you, Chris, uh, after a few times that we got together, I remember thinking, okay, this is like getting together with my cousins, except we're all gay. This is what I thought, which was a, was a big difference, you know. I was close to my family, and my family at that, they, you know, they weren't necessarily overtly homophobic, and comments were made here and there. Um, but yeah, there was, there was something, I didn't have to, I was, well, when the group started, I was 30, I guess I was 33 or 34, and uh, living at home with mom and dad, of course. Um, and uh, um, I didn't have to explain to anybody in the group that I was still living at home with mom and dad. I didn't need to explain that. Whereas I had already been on many dates and I kind of needed to explain that. Speaking of dates, Mambo Italiano came up a lot in those dates, I do have to say. I had to get ready for that question. Oh, have you seen? Yes, yes. I, well, is it true? I said, it's a comedy and it exaggerates, but good comedy is based on, on some truth. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, yeah. So you bequeathed a large archive of materials at the ar archives, the gay archives. I went there and I looked through them. Uh, among the materials I found that you left were a few letters written by gentlemen looking for the company, uh, looking for the company of Italian men. Uh, did that happen a lot? Did like people uh, kind of write to, to the organization trying to uh, date like your members? Uh, that was, actually, I forgot that they were letters. But, letters. Oh, they were letters. But there, were, there was a telephone number, and, and I often, me, myself and some other uh, people in the group, spoke to people when they first called. And yes, there was, there was a certain percentage of, of men, and perhaps women as well, who wanted to practice their Italian. Yeah, and <laughs> yes, practice. Yeah, that could be a euphemism. Um, but also that they wanted, they liked Italian culture, and they wanted to meet Italian people. You know, now we were, you know, I mean, as leader, I was pretty inclusive, but I did have to be honest with them and say that we spoke English and French more than we spoke Italian, and that no one that I knew of in the group was, you know, offering Italian lessons. <laughs> Darn. Uh, so uh, I'm going to bring V into the conversation now. Hi, V. Um, uh, you co-founded Chow, uh, Canadian Italians Against Repression, and uh, there's actually some zines over there in the back for sale too, if people want to want to see them. And uh, this was founded in 2020, and I remember at the time seeing that, and it was shocking to me because I I realized this is the first time. I've seen an Italian organization speak publicly about racism, like kind of like outside of like the community talking largely about other issues. Um, uh, so can you speak a little bit about the mission of Chow and, and the reason you started it? Uh, yeah, so we, uh, we started in the summer of 2020. Um, at that point it was just myself and one other person. And I think it was really just like a response to a response to the responses that we were seeing on social media and uh, noticing that basically every other community was kind of uh, had a position on what was happening in terms of racial injustice and police brutality. And uh, we noticed that the Italian community, even the people that were more outspoken, we're not really taking a stand. Um, and I think it was just like getting to a point where it was like uh, also very evident that, that we benefit from a lot of that. Uh, uh, like we, we have a lot of exploitation and benefit from that oppression. Um, and then at that same time, there was a group that uh, was coming out of Toronto uh, called Italian Canadians for Black Lives. And um, 
there were some members of that group who knew Cassandra, the other member of Chow at that time. And so it really just was a very organic thing that happened. Uh, we started with like an info session and kind of it was like a little bit of a support group at that point where a bunch of us just wanted to like rant and like have other people kind of understand a lot of like what we're saying of just like we don't need to explain certain things to each other. We know how it is with our families and with our community. And so having that space where we could just feel at ease was really important. Um, and then eventually we knew that we needed to use that energy in a different way and kind of try to um, do community outreach. And a lot of us were really new to activism. And so it's been, it's been slow, it's been up and down. Um, but I think like there continues to be like so much interest from so many different people in the community that it, it just feels like, okay, this clearly needs to keep being a thing because I think people are kind of counting on this, you know? And um, it's strange because at some point about a year and a half ago, uh, somebody reached out to us and said that like, he had had a similar group in the 70s that was like very much tied to uh, labor initiatives at that point and like helping factory workers, helping newly arrived immigrants, make sure that their working conditions were safe. And then learning about the work that you did in the 90s and 2000s, it feels like there's a lot of stuff that has happened that uh, we just don't really know about or have access to. And uh, it feels like the dominant kind of narrative in our culture and our community is often one that's very you know, cis and heteronormative and all of that. And so it's, yeah, it's it's kind of just like part of us trying to find ways to um, be that space, but also to recount that history and try and create a link between that and now. And I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence that like a bunch of our members are historians. <laughs> I think that there's something in like doing the history, reading that history and then coming to terms with like, oh my God, a bunch of it has been hidden from us. And uh, like, we're not actually like this or we are like this and we need to fix it, you know? I think that was... A lot of contemporary Italian culture still runs on this idea of omerta, right? Which is an Italian code of conduct that places importance in silence in the face of questioning by outsiders or authorities. And there's this desire to not interfere, right? To not speak up about certain issues because they're not seen as our issues. Um, is this why that you think that there is still, to this day, kind of like these, this like ongoing, like, you know, we, we talk about, it's Pride Month, you know, we don't see big companies uh, in my Italian companies wishing our community a happy Pride Month, right? We don't really see, uh, like you said, kind of like these big companies kind of taking a stand against certain issues. So um, can you talk a bit about this notion of Amerta and like how you feel like it kind of is like limiting the fact that we could actually kind of uh, evolve, I guess, as a people? Um, yeah, I feel like a lot of what we've spoken about tonight um, has to do with our families, and that is a huge part, obviously, since I think Italians are, you know, we all know. <laughs> I don't need to expand on that thought, we all know. Um, but there is something, like, at another level, and I, obviously I think it has to do with religion and fascism, you know, the word that kind of needs to be whispered, but like there's a lot of history there and um, I think our politics are really tied up in that and the fact that those words like won't even really be acknowledged, uh, it's it's kind of frightening, you know, it's frightening that like even in, in this day and age there are still certain taboos um, and I don't I, don't, I still don't really know the way around it other than like an entire community being willing to call things for what they are, which is like a very scary thought, but uh, because if that doesn't pan out, like I just don't know the other way forward. But I do think that there's a lot of silence and I think that that's what enables uh, or that's what uh, kind of has people stay in the closet for longer. Um, I feel like I haven't ever really like actively come out to my family my coming out is just doing this stuff basically <laughs> and so it's just like 
it's one of these things where it's like, you know, but we don't really acknowledge it because it's like easier that way to not like directly ask these questions. But I feel like we spend so much time, we have spent so much time not directly calling things for what they are. And it really, I mean, it's damaging because when you are different then you are, you're afraid to give yourself those names as well because you just, you know, then you're just, you are those words and there's nothing to change it. You've called it into existence. You've manifested it. And it's probably like, once you've done it, you can't just undo it, right? So it definitely kind of perpetuates itself. So we can have a larger discussion now. And, um, you know, this notion of like Omercha, this like code of silence around certain issues. And I'm curious, like Gaspar and um, Steve, um, is this something the two of you have experienced in your work, kind of this, like, kind of, like, silence in terms of, like, all the, you, you, everyone on the stage is extremely accomplished, but, like, can you talk a little bit about, like, your, how you've interpreted maybe that kind of silence based on the work that you've done? Um, so, yeah, I think it's just, it's part of the Italian, well, could I say culture, the, 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 the I mean, yeah, there's, there's this America, there's this, I, I always describe, especially Italian families, like, it, it's really cool, but it's kind of like a cult, being a part of the Italian family, especially in St. Leonard. I mean, I, I'm not from St. Leonard, but I remember my parents at one point wanted to move there, and I really said, don't go there, I, I don't want you, if I go, if you go there, I'm going to leave the house, I was like 10, and, <laughs> and, and I, you know, so they buy these duplexes, one next to the other. And then, so I'm 62 years old, I'm almost 62, I'm gonna preface this. So I remember when St. Leonard first came into being, so it was like the duplexes and they were big and they had fireplaces in the basement, it was like a mansion and it was marble and chandeliers and oh my God, and you're going to these places, you're like, what the fuck, you know, Jesus Christ. So there's the, the duplexes and then the parents got older and then the kids got married and the kids moved on top on the second floor. And then the family that was probably the brother and the sister who was to one next to and their kids moved on top. And all of a sudden the parents got old and they moved the parents at the bottom. And then somebody else went to the bottom. And then, they were, then the, the, the duplexes weren't big enough, so they were the treeplexes. And there's the fiveplexes. And it was all, the, all these families, they all knew each other. And I'm like, this is a freaking cult, <laughs> right? And they all loved each other and they pretended to love each other, but they didn't. Because they all talked against each other, and there was the old Omerta said, don't say that I said to that to ruin, because if you say to that, don't, so don't say that to it, and don't so say, and don't do this, and so you're like going like, okay, I can't say anything. So when I started writing and started talking about this shit, right, like the, another play that was really popular of mine was, was St. Leonard Chronicles. I couldn't understand why it was so popular. It was really about these kids who were living in St. Leonard, this was 10 years ago, and they wanted to move to Beaconsfield, and that was like the whole family drama, because, you know, the parents had paid for that, and then the parents pay for the houses, right? They, they do the down payments, and so the, it's their way of keeping control over the kids and the family, and this, the, the thing of Omerta, so don't, you know, you, you, we gave you this money, so then you're not allowed to do this, and you can't do that, and so it's not only, it's like everything, it's like just controlling everything, and, and staying in this little ghetto, and, and so... Yeah, yeah, and so the one thing I want to say is like recently I, I go to Little Italy a lot and I'm, I'm from the Chabanel Street area and so I saw this woman that I hadn't seen in a long time. She was living on Tallers like I was and she says, have you ba been back to the old neighborhood? I'm like, no, I haven't been back in a long time. And she goes, it's great, but Steve, I'm not racist. But she goes, this was in church, but she goes, it's full of Arabs now. And I'm like, Okay, and she goes, oh, the things that happen, they're just like, okay, I gotta go now, <laughs> thank you. So that again, the Omerta thing, don't say anything, I'm not racist, but it's all that, oh my God. So, in church. So, <laughs> Mussolini's right there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Back to your fascist oh, thing, there you go. So it's like fascism, God, and racism. All, like, all of them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So it's like, yeah, okay, your turn. <laughs> um, yeah, secrets. I remember for, for a long time thinking, okay, you know, I have a big secret. My 
<clears throat> I'm gay and my parents don't know and relatives don't know. And, you know, and that caused me angst. It actually, mom, <laughs> mom could have helped me out. I told her when I was 35 or 36, probably because of the Italian group. And then every few months or every few years, I'm oh, sorry about that. Every, you know, I'd ask mom, hey mom, did you tell dad? Tell them to papa. And, and no, 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 I don't you tell him. I'm like, oh, okay. So anyway, so I was 40 something when, when I told dad. Um, but okay, so for a long time, that was a big secret. But then during that time, I realized the family had lots of secrets about, and not my immediate family, but the more extended family about everything. I remember a relative of mine who had stepchildren, and we didn't know that for years, you know? Um, or people's sicknesses. Now, I understand, you know, maybe you don't want to share that with everybody, but necessarily, but with close family. So, I, so at one point I thought, okay, I, maybe it gave me some comfort, you know? Uh, you know, the, the people around me, the close people around me, have lots and lots of secrets. And it isn't, you know, just about sexuality, you know. But something else about, yeah, about keeping the truth from people. I mentioned that it was in, when I was 40-something that I told my dad. And I remember um, two, uh, speaking to two people very, very close to me, family members very close to me, and saying that I was thinking of telling my dad I was gay. Uh, I, I needed him to know. It was causing me a lot of anguish that my father didn't know. And those two people who I adore and love kind of told me, you know, oh, this is not the right time, or why are you going to do that to your dad? And I'm so glad I didn't listen to them because my dad deserved to know. Yeah, who I was. Um, so yeah, there are lots of secrets in this um, cult. <laughs> so B, I saw your head nodding a lot and, and about St. Leonard, and um, I know that you're from St. Leonard, right? No, no. no. <laughs> um, my aunt, my favorite aunt. <laughs> But you left. You decided to go to school downtown, right? You didn't really want to kind of be around um, what you were kind of hearing. And we often think with like the new generations, the younger generations, that that like the kind of homophobia that we deal with is just it's a it comes from the old country or something. It comes from the tradition, you know. Like and then maybe once you know the different generations kind of pass away, the youth will just kind of like. Um, be okay with everything, but that's not your experience, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I uh, grew up in St. Leonard. I left when I was 20, uh, at like the first chance I got, basically. But um, I also like went to high school there. El um, and I left there as well, basically, for uh, just it was like very evident at that point to me that like I just was not really part of this environment. And it's it's still very difficult for me to accept that because I feel like as an artist and in terms of so much of my identity, I love so much about being Italian, but I felt at that point like so rejected from it. Um, and so I decided to go to school downtown and like, I basically spend as little time in St. Leonard as possible until now. Um, it's, it's starting to grow on me again, weirdly enough. I don't know. It's a weird thing that's happened where I go back and maybe it's like nostalgia for childhood. <laughs> or maybe it's kind of changed. Or maybe it's just the nice parks. <laughs> but, like, honestly, I go back. It's like the gardens, you know? It's the gardens that always really yeah. Um, But I go back. I went back, like, pretty recently and I saw this like very visibly like queer teenager and she was like skateboarding and I was like oh my god who are you like I was just it was so exciting to me um so I mean little instances like that feel very rewarding I wonder if it's changed at all but uh yeah I could not I really felt like if I was gonna stay there at that point I was 
not going to survive. And I, when I left, I moved to Little Italy, which I thought was like, there's like St. Leonard, which is like the Southerners. And then like Little Italy is like the intellectual Northerners, basically. <laughs> I was like, I'm so cultured now. Um, but yeah, I feel like it also was a way to remain somewhat close to the culture without having to be in that fiveplex. Um, and yeah, it's it's really strange now thinking that like there's parts of it that feel almost like a trace of a part that I knew as a child that it doesn't really look the same anymore. The demographics are different, and uh, in some ways, it also feels like, well, it is. It's part of our history, and so it feels like when I see all these neighborhoods that are, you know, being gentrified, I feel almost uh, protective about St. Leonard, where I'm like, should I move back because this is kind of like the place that I'm from, and I want to protect it, and I want to make sure that that doesn't happen. But it's fine, y'all, because the St. Leonard landlords are doing it to themselves. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so you know the point. Just circling back to the point of the Carrie Museum, it, it's not an Italian institution, right? But it was. It, it had been informed, uh, you know, by kind of this old guard of, and we're talking a lot about that, like you know, in terms of like um, these powers that be that make these decisions that who's going, who we're going to feature, and who we're going to celebrate, and who we're going to lift out. Um, do you have any kind of insights to like what we need to do to change that, and how do we how do we do more events like this? And I want to thank the Instituto for hosting this event because I think it's really wonderful um, for them to kind of support us. Um, but it is true that some of these institutions don't. Like, do you? I don't know. Do you have any kind of reflections about that, Gaspar? This time I'm going to do it right. Um, first of all, kudos to you, Steve, because um, I think had I did not go to that exhibit. But listening to you, if I had gone to that exhibit and there was a section on the prominent Italians, let's say, I don't think I would have even thought, not so much about myself, but I wouldn't even have thought, oh, giggle should be here. And so what should we do? Well, first, we ourselves have to kind of own it, you know. We have to, I, I should you know, I, I, and I will, I will try in the future to look at things like that and say, Giggle was part of, is part of Italian uh, Montreal history and it should be there. So I think one thing that we have to do is the people like us in, in these um, communities have to feel like we're part of the greater community, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. um, I'll, I'll just say something real short. I, I feel like a big part of it is just kind of reclaiming certain spaces that have been, uh, that are Italian, but are not in any way queer or in any way not part of this like cis heteronormative uh, idea of Italianism. Um, I made a sort of quip that I'd love to see events like this happen at a place like Leonardo da Vinci Center in St. Leonard because, yeah, I mean, other than, like, my catechism there, <laughs> I didn't really spend very much time there. And the fact that that's, like, the immediate thought that I have for that cultural space and not something like this where I would have felt, oh, my God, I think it would have changed my whole life. I mean, that would have changed my life. Um, but same thing for... Casa d'Italia, I mean, I roll. Um, there was like an event that Chris and I were both at a little while ago where in my like very, you know, minimal way to sort of subvert whatever's happening there, like wore the like gayest makeup I could possibly do. But it's like, it's not going to remove the fascist symbols on the floor, you know? Um, but... It's to me that's the biggest challenge is like how do we how are we supposed to be present in these spaces that not only have done such a good job of keeping us out, but are literally, you know, literally and symbolically spaces that really fucking hate us. You know, like this is a building that has fascist symbols in it. And walking in as a non-binary person 
and thinking about that history is really intense. Do I want to pay to rent a space here and kind of continue that cycle? I know it seems weird, but it's like if I'm paying a rental fee to this same place that refuses to even acknowledge that history, am I not kind of participating in it and enabling it? So to me, that's the biggest challenge. So um, first of all, I think it's amazing that we're at the Instituto Italiano di Cultura because 20 years ago we wouldn't have been here, that's for sure. Um, to your point, uh, being at the Casa d'Italia and being at the uh, Leonardo da Vinci Center, we absolutely have to be there because it is our job to say about those organizations and the fascist stuff and whatever, fuck off, we're here now, okay? So we have to claim those spaces. You may applaud, thank you. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Nothing I say merits applause, trust me, in any capacity, I mean. But we do need to reclaim these spaces because what's happening, and again, because of my old age, I can tell you this, yes. <laughs> It is not the community that is the problem. It is the so-called leaders of the community who are the problems. The people who run the Casa d'Italia and all the fucking money stuff that goes on there. The Leonardo da Vinci thing center is the same thing. It is people with money that go in there and rent the theaters and rent the spaces and present their vision of what the Italian community is. Same thing for La Settimana Italiana. Beautiful, Mill Italy, Settimana Italiana. You go there and it's like people are selling air conditioners on the street. I mean, it's, it's like, it's, you know, it, no, really, it's all about how much money you have, how much money you could do, and, 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 and is this going to bring you money? It's all a big business. So it's, our, it's up to us, and I'm not an organizer, so people like, like you, and, and I don't know you, and I know you used to, I mean, I know you now, it's really nice to meet you, and I'm really proud of you for doing what you did, because I think that is so cool, and it's really up to the younger generation to take us to another place. I mean, you know, we've, we've done our part, like, like, pass the torch to you. So, and it, wonderful, you, what you've done, leaving St. Leonard, going to face, and, and, and amazing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, as for the fascist symbols, you know, they're there. They're always going to be there. That is also part of our history. So we can't really erase them. What we, the best we could do is we could put a plaque there explaining why. What? They won't. They won't. But you know what? Let's put pressure on them to try to do it. I mean, you know, the, the thing is, again, I can only talk from my experience. The Italian community has embraced me, has always embraced me. It's always like, when is your next uh, play? We're gonna go see your play. People have never been to the theater, go see my stuff, you know? And it, 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 I went and see my stuff, I don't know now, maybe they might not go, but they did. But it's, again, it's the, the people up here, the people, like I said, the, mostly the old white men from another generation, they're the ones who are making all the decisions for us. And this is amazing because you made the decision to, you know, have this event, and that's we, we have we have to do more of this, and we have to go to the Casa d'Italia, and we have to go to the Leonardo da Vinci Center, and if they want don't want us there, we go anywhere, anyway, you know, and and yeah, that's all I have to say. Let's go right now. Let's. Go. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do want to say V is um, actually going to be doing something like. Uh, bringing bocce, right? Like, kind of, the, the, you're going to bring bocce to St. Leonard with, yeah. uh, or maybe not? Yeah, or no, no. Okay. Well, I mean, it's there. We're just going to be, well, oh, sorry. sorry. sorry about that. Um, we're going to do summer event. We hope to do it. We're going to do it in St. Leonard. We don't know which park yet. Um, uh, in mid August, we're trying to do it for like Benagosco, but. Um, yeah, the idea is just to kind of be more closely in contact with the elderly community in St. Leonard, which I feel like because we're very much on social media and in spaces like this, we haven't yet connected with. Um, so just stay tuned on our socials, I guess, for that announcement. And we're also like going to put up posters all over St. Leonard for it. So I'll be back at the five plex. So I'm going <laughs> to get my little, you know, like ricotta container filled with leftovers before I leave. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, 
those are my questions. Can we give a round of applause for um, Steve Lugicchio, Gaspar Barcelino, and Gigi Gregoria? We've got a couple minutes, so I wanted to see if anyone had a question, or yes? Okay, hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into the... Hi, what's your question? Uh, my question is for Gaspari. Uh, my name is Antonia Caserta. Hello, Antonia. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Um, actually, I have, well, first I wanted to make uh, a point. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, Leonardo da Vinci was gay, wasn't he? Maybe someone should point it out to the center. <laughs> And uh, my question for you, Gaspari, yes. I'm just curious, if it's not too personal, mm -hmm. what are you doing like, no, um, <laughs> what was your father's reaction? Uh, ha, ha. That is a good one. That, yeah, that, I'll get up for that. Yeah. That was a really good one, which has been brewing in my mind the last few days, and, and ever since it happened, actually. So, yeah, so I was, I, I when my what was that? It was around 2000, so I was 40-something, uh, yeah, late 40s. And so I decided to tell my dad, and it was just him and I, and, you know, speaking, well, secrets and lots of things that we don't talk about in family, so... In my family, anyway, we spoke to mom, poor mom, we, talk, we spoke to her about a lot of things, if not everything, but we didn't speak to dad about very much, you know. And so when I sat down next to dad and said, dad, I have something to tell you, and I, that's probably the first time I ever said that, I have something to tell you, you know. Anyway, so then I put my arm around him, and I think, or whatever, and I said, uh, Dad, no me piace no donne. This is how I put it, because it because it's really hard. So I said I don't I don't like women. And he put his arm around me, and said, "Good." And uh, yeah, yeah. And I, as you could tell tonight, I cried. Imagine that. Anyway, so I kind of had tears, and I said, "Oh, Dad," because you know I thought it was gonna. I thought, you know, this is really hard, and I thought you weren't going to react properly, or whatever, you weren't going to take it well. Uh, I have a friend, you know, I had a boyfriend at the time, and then his reaction changed. And I, yeah, he thought I was just telling him I didn't like women, and he was, you know, and actually later that evening, my boyfriend at the time said, doesn't your dad like your mom? Like, why was he so happy that you don't like women? <laughs> Which, so his reaction just changed, and I thought, oh, God. He didn't get it, he didn't get it. So then I kind of said, you know, I have a boyfriend, and then poor dad, then, you know, all the, then he said, don't have children now, because I know that's what they do. And I said, you know, that's not what I'm talking about, dad, I just want to tell you that I'm gay, you know. And then I told him, that kind of helped out in a, in a way, in a weird way. I said, dad, mom already knows, so you know, you can talk to her about it. So then the, the uh, sequel to that was a few hours later when I was really worried about the two of them who I had just left home, at, at home, and I went back. I finally, oh yeah, if you wait long enough, if you live with your parents, at least at that time, if you live with your parents long enough, they move out. <laughs> okay? So that's, that's what happened. That's what happened. And, and just to, to segue into, someone recently said, Ooh, that's kind of creepy, still living, living in the house where you always lived. And I said, yeah, but I said, if you know Italians, they all lived in the basement and they preserved the first floor. That helped me out because I was like, challenge, I'm going to live on the first floor the way you're supposed to live in a house, right? So it's like, it's not creepy at all. But anyway, so I went back to home. I went home and then a few hours later, I checked on mom to see how, you know, and I, so I called, I said, hello, ma, and there was like, hello, and I, I thought, okay, I, she goes, you had to tell him, I said, yes, mom, I did, I did have to tell him, and then she said, and you had to tell him that I knew, and I said, and I said yeah, mom, I did, so that now you could talk about it, anyway, so that's how that went, um, 
you know, life has a way, it just has a way. It, it wasn't, no, it was a bit of time. We didn't really talk about it. I mean, I broke up with that boyfriend, so they didn't actually meet that boyfriend. And then by the time there was another boyfriend, dad, you know, dad had dementia with Parkinson's, so he didn't seem to really understand. And I said to my mom once, I said, you see, mom, the way life is, we were so worried about dad, but now we don't really even know his reaction. The really nice thing is that mom, you know, was uh, sick with cancer. That's not the nice thing, obviously. The really nice thing is that she met a boyfriend of mine who she still didn't want to meet. She was, she didn't want to meet him, but I introduced them and they really, really, really bonded just before she passed away. So, and I told my mom, I was able to tell her that was a real gift, mom, you know, thank you. So that's all that kind of. So we probably have time for one more question. Any, okay, we're right there at the back. If I may, I'm gonna shout out my question. Yeah, yeah. I, wanna, I, I, oh, <laughs> I wanna just address the speaker who just commented about the Leonard. <laughs> because there's a white hetero male who lives there. Uh, I wanted to tell you, you never lived there, right? No. It makes me no. think of the hetero white guy who criticizes gay sex. Uh-huh. <laughs> hetero white guy who criticizes gay sex. You've never lived in San Diego? No. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. You've never experienced it. So. No, well, my extended family's lived in San Diego, so I was there every Sunday, and my, I still have cousins who live there, and, and I know I know all the parks, and I know the Aluna, the Liturgy Center, and and uh, I was there when they, in, like my best friend moved there, and, and in 1968, and I saw the whole Santa Cabrini area being developed. I was there every freaking weekend. Like I said, we almost moved to St. Leonard because my cousin had a free apartment upstairs in her duplex and she wanted us to move upstairs. And I'm like, no, I ain't going here. And uh, every Sunday we went and in the summer it smelled of uh, les feux de foyer outside because everybody had their... their yeah, so, so yeah, I, I, I never really lived there, but you know, I've, I've yeah, I've experienced it. I got the gist of it, I think so. I didn't never got the gist of gay sex, though. <laughs> <laughs> it was just sex to you. <laughs> Maybe just one more. Greg, you had your hand up at the same time. I just uh, want to say a positive note, and maybe in some way, uh, the, um, I belong to a volunteer organization called SILK, which goes into schools uh, to talk about, L we're invited into schools to talk about LGBTQ. Uh, queer and trans issues, and um, we go to uh, Laurie and McDonald. Oh, that does make me happy. Too. Well, and we've done. I've gone for a few years there. Uh, I have to be the one to speak, and it's not only that. There's a um, Gay Straight Alliance little group there wow. in uh, Laurie and McDonald wow. School. I mean, it's obviously because one or two teachers took the initiative mm -hmm. to start to change yeah. things, wow. despite what other people did, and they just invited us in, and it worked. And um, so I just wanted to say that that's yeah. kind of a change in St. Leonard, because that's Lauren and McDonald High School, it's the high school, isn't it? I think it's pretty much St. Leonard. St. Leonard. And guess what? You invited a non-Italian into your Italian <laughs> sure. group, and you were very open to uh, other people coming in. I had some great times there. And Steve, I used to work on Gay Line, and you used oh, Gay yeah. Line for part of your uh, Malibu Italiano. Yeah, I'm thinking as I'm sitting here, there's three links. <laughs> Maybe your name is Forrest Gum. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry, we're out of time. There is a question here, but maybe afterwards you can come up and maybe ask one of the panelists. So I just want to uh, thank our panelists again, um, Steve, Gaspar, and Edie. Um, I want to thank you all for being here too. Uh, for a wonderful evening, I'd like to thank our hosts, uh, Sandra Capelli and Laura, Mor uh, Laura Molay. Um, and the team here at the Institute. Um, but uh, thanks to Licha also again, uh, Justin uh, and Beatrice. Uh, thanks to Dominic at Longbridge Books. If you like more discussion on queer telling Canadian identity, I invite you to pick up a copy of the book here and now, which is um, at the back for sale. V also has copies of uh, Canadian Italians Against Oppression, uh, the zine at the back. 
And a big thank you also to Fierté Montréal. Uh, Pride is on. Uh, it takes place in Montreal. Most of the events between August 1st and 7th, so be sure to check out that. I also run a reading series. If people don't know, it's called The Violet Hour. It's an LGBTQ reading series. Uh, it takes place at Stock Bar, which is a strip club in the village. So if you're curious, um, Saturday, there's one this Saturday at 6 o'clock. So um, love to see you there. All right. Uh, good night. Thank you.